this lecture, I'm going to talk about one of Nietzsche's works that, in a sense, is an aberration from the way he often writes. Um, this is actually the book that he thinks is his most important, or claims to at times, Thus Spoke Zarathustra. Most of Nietzsche's works, as we've discussed, are either in essay form or, very commonly, aphoristic form. But Thus Spoke Zarathustra is the only work in which he makes a sort of sustained stab at fiction although a highly philosophical kind of fiction. So what I'm going to be discussing are perhaps some of his bases for choosing this form in the first place and some of the very interesting ideas that come out in the book. One way of getting a sense of why Nietzsche might have chosen to write about a Persian prophet and one that wasn't all that well known in Europe was that Nietzsche saw in Zarathustra a kind of counterpart to some of the heroes indeed his own heroes, from his own tradition. Nietzsche has in mind his heroes, uh, despite the kind of obvious sense in which they aren't heroes, Jesus and Socrates, as having been the beginners of a tradition that he thought basically went downhill. Strangely enough, although Jesus and Socrates would seem to be representatives of exactly what Nietzsche disliked about his tradition, he seems to think that for all of what he sees as faults in their tradition, these men were some of the most important people in world history and also, in a certain sense, his philosophical rivals. For example, he tends to think of both of them as something like the Hebrew prophets, people who were critical of the excesses of their times and people who had ideas about how to reform the world in what they thought was a better way. Nietzsche himself certainly thinks that that typical kind of project is something he wants to do for his own time. So in that, he thought that Jesus and Socrates were both, in a sense, similar or kindred spirits. Also, more specifically, there were ideas that Jesus and Socrates had that he tended to think well of. For example, in Socrates' case, Socrates suggested the idea of the philosopher king, that the rule by a king should not be something that's a matter simply of party politics, but instead people should choose leaders on the basis of their wisdom, and institutions should be arranged in that kind of way. These are ideas that Nietzsche is quite sympathetic to. Similarly, in the case of Jesus, Jesus himself was a great critic of people in his own religious tradition, as well as some of the excesses of behavior in the Roman Empire, and Nietzsche similarly felt that that was a very reasonable kind of approach to their life and times. Interestingly, though, in the case of both Jesus and Socrates, the way that history has come to know these figures is not through their own writings, but through the writings of others. In the case of Jesus, this is the four evangelists, and in the case of Socrates, it's Plato's dialogues. In a sense, what Nietzsche is trying to do in Zarathustra is to write something comparable to the New Testament or to the Platonic dialogues. And focusing on a different hero, but a hero in a sense of a same, the same kind of stature as Jesus and Socrates, namely, in a sense, the West's earliest philosopher, Zarathustra. Zarathustra, as um, many of you may know, was a famous Persian prophet, indeed the um, first religious hero that we tend to hear about in that part of the Middle East. What Nietzsche found interesting about Zarathustra, I think, was that Zarathustra, in a sense, was one of the earliest religious spokespeople, the founder of a new religion, and a new religion that tended to have its um, consequence for later religious traditions in the West. To say a bit about the historical Zarathustra, he lived in a time when things were starting to change in his own location. India and Persia had both largely been part of the same religious tradition up until this point. And the political situation had started to change when some people settled down in stable communities, whereas other people remained nomadic, as had been the general practice in the region. And Zarathustra's appearance on the scene um, came at a time when there was a lot of concern about the fact that those who'd settled were constantly being victimized by raiders who'd come in on horseback and take food, um, take whatever they wanted to, basically. And not surprisingly, in a case where there was a lot of um, pain going on, there was a tendency to think of this in terms of religion. So, for instance, many of Zarathustra's contemporaries tended to think that 
if these invaders were actually succeeding in taking things from their community, their gods must be stronger. What Zarathustra did was, in a sense, to separate the Persian religion from the Indian tradition of which it had been a part. Zarathustra insisted that some of the deities that had been worshipped in the past, namely the devas, the very deities that um, we tend to learn about in the Hindu pantheon to this day, should not be worshipped. If people in the settled communities of Persia were worshipping them, in a sense, they were adding to their power. And this power seemed to be what was actually allowing their enemies to come in and uh, take things out of their city. So instead, what they should do is stop all of that worship and instead focus on the worship of a different kind of deity, the Ahura, and particularly a supreme Ahura, Ahura Mazda, the supreme god. In this sense, Zarathustra was the founder of Western monotheism. It's a qualified monotheism, to be sure. Uh, the idea of worshiping a supreme god didn't equate in Zarathustra's mind to the idea that there was only one god. There were other gods, other deities. It's just that they weren't as powerful and shouldn't be encouraged um, in some cases. But nevertheless, there was a kind of move in the direction that later uh, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam all followed, the idea of a single god to whom worship should be focused. More interestingly, and away from Nietzsche's point of view, Zarathustra's main religious innovation, besides this um, claim that the single supreme god should be the focus of worship, was the idea that good and evil should be distinguished. This is particularly interesting in Nietzsche's case because Nietzsche actually takes issue with the way good and evil have been understood in his own tradition. So the fact that he's chosen as his spokesperson in a way, a person who founded the idea of taking this as a very serious dichotomy is something that in a way needs to be explained. Strangely enough, I think the tendency oftentimes in reading Nietzsche's book Zarathustra is not to notice that he's Play, placing so much emphasis on the original simply because his Zarathustra talks about modern problems and so on. Nevertheless, it's very clear Nietzsche did have the historical Zarathustra in part in mind when he wrote the opening. The way he concluded the book that he had finished right before Zarathustra was to present a kind of arrival of Zarathustra on the scene, and he basically takes this same section as the opening for Thus Book Zarathustra. So I'll, I'll read this passage in full and then comment. When Zarathustra was 30 years old, he left his home and Lake Ermi and went into the mountains. There he enjoyed his spirit and his solitude and for 10 years did not tire of that. But at last his heart changed and one morning he rose with the dawn, stepped before the sun and spoke to it thus, you great star, what would your happiness be if you did not have those for whom you shine? For 10 years you have climbed up to my cave. You would have become weary of your light and of the journey had it not been for me and my eagle and my serpent. But we waited for you every morning, took your overflow from you, and blessed you for it. Behold, I am sick of my wisdom, like a bee that has gathered too much honey. I need hands outstretched to receive it. I want to give away and distribute until the wise among men enjoy their folly once again and the poor their riches. For that I must descend to the depths as you do in the evening when you go behind the sea and still bring light to the underworld, you overrich star. Like you, I must go under, as men put it to whom I wish to descend. Bless me then your calm eye that can look without envy even upon an all too great happiness. Bless the cup that wants to overflow in order that the water may flow from it, golden, and carry the reflection of your rapture everywhere. Behold, this cup wants to become empty again, and Zarathustra wants to become man again. Thus Zarathustra began to go under. Now, a number of features of that opening, I think, are extremely interesting. One of which is that it's quasi-biblical in style. We have an invocation, a kind of hymn to a god, in effect, uh, as Zarathustra begins this journey. And though Zarathustra in Nietzsche's story is going to be, in a sense, a spokesperson for his atheistic view of the world, nevertheless, there's this opening in which Zarathustra certainly is positioned as a kind of religious prophet. Um, I think there's a very, that's a clear indication that Nietzsche has a historical Zarathustra in mind. 
he also mentions explicitly Lake Ermi, which is the vicinity of the area that the original Zarathustra lived in. And apparently the um, story goes that Zarathustra did live in a mountain cave. Another thing that comes through in this kind of uh, quasi-biblical invocation is the way in which Zarathustra is being presented as a kind of counterpart to Jesus and also to Socrates. To Jesus in the sense that he begins his mission at the age of 30, or at least we hear mention of him at the age of 30, in a sense stopping and reflecting, going into retirement before beginning a mission to humanity. Immediately, he's unlike Christ, who went briefly into the desert, 40 days, um, was tempted there, and immediately launched into his mission to humanity. Zarathustra, by contrast, stayed in solitude for 10 years and only descends to humanity later on. But when he does descend to humanity, there's a kind of reference to a very famous story in the Platonic Dialogues. Uh, Plato's Republic includes Socrates' story, The Myth of the Cave, in which he speaks of people who have spent their whole lives chained in a cave and basically see only shadows cast against a wall by things moving um, around between a fire in back of them and, um, the, and the screen, in effect, of the wall. And therefore, their whole world, their whole sense of what's out there is just these shadows. The story goes that one of them was able to escape the cave to go out into the world, to see the sun, to see all the kinds of things in the world, and suddenly see what the real situation is. This person, according to Socrates, would be overwhelmingly full of desire to go down to his fellows in the cave and tell them what he discovered. Unfortunately, people who lived in the cave would not believe this. Um, they, they knew their world and this was not it. In addition, by changing from the very bright light of the external world to the cave again, the person returning to the cave actually seems to have lost his eyesight and therefore can be dismissed as well. In a sense then, Zarathustra is taking on that position of the philosopher who is returning to humanity, though strangely enough, it was the cave in which he gained his wisdom, not uh, spending time out in the open world of the valley. So there's a kind of uh, attempt to turn some details of the traditional stories on their heads. And indeed, that's what Zarathustra does. He, in a sense, is addressing the same kinds of important religious questions that he thought that Socrates and Jesus both did, but at the same time in somewhat novel ways. And that's one of the um, structural features that I think is quite important about the book. There are all kinds of allusions to Plato and the New Testament, which indicate that Nietzsche is concerned that Zarathustra addressed some of the same issues, but sometimes in ways that deviate considerably. One of the very important features of the historical Zarathustra that um, I think is relevant here is that the historical Zarathustra was not so interested in another world. There seems to have been a kind of political motivation in the first place for his talking about gods, talking about good and evil, allying yourself with the right force and uh, maintaining a kind of stance of firm enmity against the other, all of this had a certain kind of earthly basis, namely the situation of his community in his time. Zarathustra was also quite adamant that uh, people who worshipped Ahura Mazda should be agrarian. They should help to um, raise cattle, particularly, and also to farm, and that this was part of their obligation as uh, people that were members of the religion. So again, there's a kind of emphasis on this world as opposed to focusing all attention to another world. And that, I think, Nietzsche would be extremely pleased about. In fact, one of the first things he has Zarathustra do as soon as he descends from the mountain is arrive in a community and claim, I teach you the meaning of the earth. It's the meaning of the earth that's going to be important to Nietzsche's Zarathustra, not so much seeking the meaning of the earth in something completely other. Zarathustra begins his uh, general mission after um, a kind of speech about teaching the meaning of the earth with a story that is a parable and a parable that isn't really located anywhere in time and place. In this respect, it resembles Hegel's famous master and slave dialectic where we have a master and slave interact, but we don't know where they are in time and space. 
presumably because this is a kind of model that fits lots of situations. The stories Arathistra tells is not so much about um, the interaction of two different individuals, but more the interaction of one individual with a whole tradition. And he tells of three stages that such an individual uh, faces, at least if this individual evolves ideally. First of all, a spiritual person is going to adopt the stage of what Zarathustra calls the camel, the camel who would bear much. And what he has in mind here is someone who takes on the burden of the tradition, learns it thoroughly, um, is willing to carry it, um, who spends a livelihood in a sense, carrying on things that have been learned from the tradition. As Nietzsche sees it, this is certainly the starting point for any kind of spiritual development. And I think this is a quite interesting contrast with the way Nietzsche is often perceived. Nietzsche has often been viewed as someone who basically turned aside his tradition and wanted to do something completely different. I think this story suggests otherwise, that indeed the move that Nietzsche made in saying no to certain things about his tradition are already based on having absorbed the tradition and treated it with a great deal of reverence. It's only at stage two that one starts to question some of it. And this is the stage that Zarathustra describes as the lion stage. In the stage of the lion, the soul stops simply following what the tradition has suggested and starts to evaluate and to say no, um, to assert individuality by questioning, challenging some of the things that have simply been handed on as the truth. And it's in this stage that uh, perhaps we see the image of Nietzsche um, fitting most precisely, the idea that having learned the tradition, suddenly a certain maturity is reached at which point questions can be asked. So no longer simply serving the tradition, but saying no to parts of it becomes the important thing. However, this is not the final stage. And again, this counters the common image of Nietzsche. The final stage moves beyond this no-saying stage where um, the soul is simply rejecting to a new kind of affirmation. And this final stage is characterized metaphorically as the stage of the child. The child at this point has a kind of boundless energy for what's new, for experimentation. In one of Nietzsche's other works, he talks about how a man's maturity is returning to the kind of seriousness had at play by children. And if you think about children at play, there is a kind of seriousness in all the games involved, but none of them are viewed as the fundamental matter of things. Uh, you finish a game and start another one. There's a kind of willingness to, in a sense, regenerate one's activities not to be caught either in simply obeying or simply defying, but having a kind of new creative energy that comes out of oneself. So the image of the child for Nietzsche is an image of full creative response and full vitality that one sees in children at play, discovering the world for the first time. It's a kind of image of a new innocence. So despite the fact that already this kind of evolution of the soul has involved learning the whole tradition, rejecting some of it. Only now are you in a stage to really become a child, to start over and deal with the world in your own way. And that's what Zarathustra holds up as an ideal. Another way of capturing the notion of the ideal for Zarathustra is this famous expression, the Übermensch, the overman or superman. And indeed, this term does come up very early in the book, um, in Zarathustra's first speech, after all, to his... Um, humanity that he finds gathered before him, he starts talking about teaching the overman and the overman or ubermensch being the meaning of the earth. And as we've mentioned in earlier lectures, it's not so much that Nietzsche is talking about an evolutionary goal of a straightforward sort, but I think that perhaps the best way of making some sense of the image is to think of it in terms of this image of the child. The ubermensch is someone who is like humanity in a lot of ways, but more capable, um, having transcended a lot of human limitations. In a sense, this kind of boundless vitality of the child is something that is being presented here as a kind of ideal, a way of approaching reality. And the Übermensch, as Zarathustra characterizes it, is a way of being that involves risk-taking, 
um, not concerning yourself so much with um, simply going about your everyday routine, but always thinking of new ways of approaching things and not being unwilling to take risks in order to bring something better about. The idea of um, having certain kinds of aspirations and being willing to stake your life on them, in a sense, is what Zarathustra thinks is really urgent. Uh, the whole idea of passion and passionate involvement, even if, of course, you end up risking life and limb, of course, you're spending your energy, which is finite, and your lifespan, which is finite, on some particular quest. Nevertheless, he thinks that's the kind of nobility that we ought to view as ideal. We ought to become heroes, but not heroes of a tradition that we haven't had a part in. Instead, heroes of new ways of thinking things through, new ideas that we've developed ourselves after having been nurtured by the tradition. The Ubermensch is presented as this kind of image of an ideal way to be. And I think maybe one could consider it also a kind of general uh, placeholder for one's notion of greatness. Exactly what it amounts to, to be great or to do something great, is going to depend very much on who you are, what time you're living in, what your circumstances are, and so on. But the idea of the Ubermensch is we can always do something better. We shouldn't just view humanity and the arrival of humanity on the scene as the be-all, end-all of nature. Let's see if we can transcend the human all to human. Um, maybe people have tended to have these weaknesses, but let's see if we can move beyond that. In his opening speech, Zarathustra contrasts the Ubermensch with another image, which he fears might be the actual outcome of further evolution, or actually devolution, namely what he calls the last man. The last man is a kind of caricature of really the opposite of the Ubermensch, someone who will take no risks whatsoever, someone who has no ambitions whatsoever, in effect the ultimate couch potato, who really basically wants to be comfortable. In a way, this image um, is a kind of lampoon against the utilitarians who talk about trying to bring about a state where pain is minimized. Nietzsche frequently suggests that you can minimize pain by making yourself completely numb and avoiding any situation in which you exert yourself, but what kind of a life is that? And indeed, that's how he presents the last man. Uh, the last man is very much convinced that this way of being is great because it is calm and comforting. Um, there's a sense in which the last man has, as Zarathustra puts it, invented happiness. But it's a very kind of feeble happiness, and a happiness that doesn't see beyond the present moment. This kind of not seeing beyond the present moment makes the last man the last man. The last man, in a sense, would be the end of the road, the end of this kind of continual cycle of regeneration of which Earth and human life participates. So by comparison with Schopenhauer's story of the insect that over and over again tries to um, find a mate, mate, and then immediately dies, only to start the cycle up again, that's a much more meaningful way of existing than the last man who basically doesn't even have the desire to move beyond the couch. The Ubermensch, by contrast, is, in a sense, the descendant of us if we really decide to take ourselves seriously enough to make goals for ourselves to attempt things, to attempt things that might cause us to perish in the process. An interesting aspect of the little passage I read you where Zarathustra appears is that Zarathustra is said to have decided to go under. And this is actually a play on words in German. Um, untergehen, um, go under, is on the one hand a word that's used to describe the sun setting at the end of the day with the idea that Although setting happens, so does regeneration when the morning comes. Also, Untergehen has the notion of dying, perishing. So there's a sense in which what Zarathustra decides to do is to commit himself fully to the task of extending his wisdom to others, even if it kills him in the process. And any kind of work one chooses to do, in a sense, does use up your life. There is a sense in which whatever you undertake is, in a way, a route to death. And Zarathustra sees that too. But he's made a decision at this point that what he's going to commit himself to, the work he's going to undertake in his life, is going to be 
this effort to return to humanity and to go under literally to perish in the process. Nietzsche through Zarathustra suggests that that's in a sense the only way to be, to decide on a project that of course you know is finite in the sense that your lifespan is finite, but nevertheless to make something of it, to make something that you can visualize as great and to keep trying even if it isn't a completely successful experiment. Interestingly enough, Zarathustra's own efforts aren't entirely successful. When he makes this speech, for example, he finds that a crowd has gathered for a circus. And when he's talking about the last man, they think, well, this is probably a performer. Bring the performer out, they tell him. Um, Zarathustra's been mistaken, in effect, for a circus barker. And there are lots of really perverse things that happen through the, the story, I mean, in a sense, a novel, in which Zarathustra is completely misunderstood. Much of the dynamic, I would say, of the novel has to do with failures to make himself understood on Zarathustra's part and efforts he comes up with in order to overcome that. So he wants to present a story in which even presenting an individual's work, the work of Zarathustra, um, even though he's presenting this as a kind of ideal in that he's really committed himself, it's not a completely risk-free proposition. Um, it has all kinds of risks involved in it. And Zarathustra often feels like a complete failure. And it's this kind of regenerating commitment to his task that tells the story of much of the novel. In this respect, I think he's drawing on what actually is another reason that Nietzsche chooses Zarathustra as a kind of spokesperson. Nietzsche himself, in talking about Zarathustra later on in his autobiography, points out that people haven't found his choice of Zarathustra nearly as interesting as he thinks it is. And he comments, I have not been asked, as I should have been asked, what the name of Zarathustra means in my mouth, the mouth of the first immoralist. For what constitutes the tremendous historical uniqueness of that Persian is just the opposite of this. Zarathustra was the first to consider the fight of good and evil the very wheel and the machinery of things. The transposition of morality into the metaphysical realm as a force, cause, and end in itself is his work. But this question itself is at bottom its own answer. Zarathustra created this most calamitous error, morality. Consequently, he must also be the first to recognize it. Not only has he more, had more experience in this matter for a longer time than any other thinker, after all, the whole of history is a refutation by experiment of the principle that the so-called of the so-called moral world order. What is more important is that Zarathustra is more truthful than any other thinker. His doctrine and his alone posits truthfulness as the highest virtue. This means the opposite of the cowardice of the idealist who flees from reality. Zarathustra has more intestinal fortitude than all other thinkers taken together. To speak the truth and to shoot well with arrows, that is Persian virtue. Am I understood? The self-overcoming of morality out of truthfulness the self-overcoming of the moralist into his opposite, into me, that is what the name Zarathustra means in my mouth. I think this is really a shocking statement because he's in effect saying that Zarathustra, even by distinguishing good and evil, was already starting the path that led forward to Nietzsche, who puts good and evil aside. And what he's suggesting here is that what Zarathustra really did was create a kind of basic distinction where distinctions weren't being made and rather than follow through by making more refined distinctions, the tradition just stuck with that first one. So it treats good and evil as two, in a sense, pales which you can place every human action in. It's good or evil, nothing more subtle need be done. And Nietzsche's view is Zarathustra, being a very truthful person, would never have seen this as the best outcome for what he attempted. What he attempted was to become more refined in one's understanding. Similarly, the fact that Zarathustra is committed to truthfulness allies Nietzsche, uh, sorry, allies um, Nietzsche's Zarathustra and allies Nietzsche himself with his project because what in effect happens here is that it's truthfulness, Nietzsche would claim, that has led him to question the existence of the Christian God or to question a good and evil. And this is precisely, too, what his Zarathustra attempts to show. Zarathustra attempts to preach this kind of new vision of reality without the Christian God and indeed, much of the story involves his attempt to learn how to live in a meaningful way without the Christian God. He, too, sees a kind of 
sadness in the wake of what he views as God's death. But with this sadness, he attempts instead to bring about a kind of way in which meaning can be understood. In that way, he thinks that he actually is continuing the work of Zarathustra, that Zarathustra has evolved into him. Thank you.